in this video, we're going to begin to talk about networking. We've got several videos that we're going to do, but for this one, I want to kind of step back in history a little bit and show you what an old NIC card looked like. A network interface card. It used coax cable. That's called a BNC connector. And it would connect here, or there's an RJ45, so this was a relatively modern NIC card. And there's a couple interesting things to look at on that card. Notice it has a ROM chip, read-only memory. That was clearly manufactured and printed at the factory and then soldered to that particular circuit card. So that has software on it that's burned into it to make it firmware because it's not going to change, right? And so if they want to update that, they've got to basically issue a new card. However, it also has a socket where you could put an updated chip. So that socket would be for a PROM or an EEPROM. Um, I don't think that would support an EEPROM at this point because that's an older card. But basically, this had an expansion capability and it had some of the things we've been talking about. So I thought that was kind of cool to leave up there. But we're going to talk about how do we connect computers. These things, by the way, are now a tiny little piece of your motherboard. Okay, the network attachment has become so small and so simple that it's now part of the motherboard. By the way, if the part of the motherboard goes bad and your computer will no longer connect to the internet or to a network, and I've seen this on laptops, uh, especially as they get older and tend to run a little hot, if that happens, you can still attach um, external devices that are plugged in through a USB port, or if it's a desktop where it happens, you can actually plug one of the, a newer version of the NIC card in and regain your access to a network. Okay, the first thing we're gonna talk about are switches. Now, what I want you to, the way I want you to remember this is switches help us build a network, a single particular network. So when I built my network in my office here, in my basement, I have at least one switch. I think I actually have two or three by the time I'm done with it. But basically, those switches help me build my network, my local area network, or my LAN, okay? Now, so switches build networks, okay? There's two flavors to think about, dumb switches and smart switches. What's the difference? One, cost. You can get these at Walmart now. Lynx is sells them for like 20, 30 bucks. They are dirt cheap. And all it does is it, it, it takes your IP address and any packets that come for your computer, it sends them through the cable to your computer. That's it. It's a dumb switch. It just moves packets. Okay, and we're going to talk about that in a later video. But this just moves packets. Smart switches give you other capabilities. There is firmware in a smart switch that gives you other software that allows you to do things like scheduling, permissions, different types of things where you can prioritize certain switch channels. Depending on how much you want to pay for a switch, you can do a lot of different things and all it is is layered on software and think layered on cost, okay? 90% of what you will ever do in a home or a, even a small business, dumb switch does fine, okay? But switches together build a network. All right, the second piece is routers. Now I'm showing a very simple one, but routers connect different networks to each other, okay? So if we're talking about my house or your house or anyone's house, the way we connect to the internet, which is a different network than our local area network at our home, okay, is through a router. Now they're sometimes called cable modems because they frequently come from the cable company, okay? But what you're connecting to is a router that has a bridge between what's called your external IP address and your internal IP address. And again, we'll deal with that when we talk about the internet and the OSI model. But the IP address of this 
Surface Pro is not the same thing as the IP address of my router. So when this Surface Pro asks for a web page, it goes out through my router with my router's address. And when the packet comes back to my router, the router knows via the switch to send it to this particular device. Okay, so every device in your house is going to have its own IP address and they make up your local network, but then your router that connects you to the internet has an external IP address that's basically your house. Okay, so the other thing that you need to understand is a lot of this stuff begins to merge and that makes it very confusing for people. And that's why I say switches build networks and routers connect other networks to each other. Because if you look at the back of a typical cable modem, it has basically the cable coming in and look at this, that's a switch. Okay, so they're hybrids. So in the back of my modem is a switch and it's the same thing. So what is, well, they call them cable modems, um, but basically that's a modem it's also a switch, okay? So don't let that confuse you. If you see a little quadrant of these kind of things, that's the switch function where it comes in. That's the, now this could be a fiber, you know, if you've got AT&T, this could be fiber coming in or coax, but that is, that is connecting to the router function of what this is. So switches build networks and routers connect networks to each other, okay? The other big piece I want you to understand, we're going to spend a little bit of time on these guys, is firewalls. Um, if you've ever seen Game of Thrones, winter is coming. The wall, that big wall in the north to keep um, the bag. I don't even remember what they were called. But basically to keep the guys out that they didn't want coming through that wall, okay, that wall was their protection, okay. We've... We've termed firewalls for computers to do the exact same thing, okay? We want to keep bad packets which contain viruses, and we're going to do a whole video on that. We want to keep that out, okay? So we, we've created these things called firewalls that can either be simple firewalls or they can be very complex, and there's different flavors we're going to talk about. But a firewall's job is to only let into your network what you want let into your network. And hackers and bad guys are forever trying to figure out how to get past your firewall. Okay? So let's talk about, and here's a good example of kind of the design of, you know, the concept of a firewall. If I'm with a company and they give me a laptop, I basically want to make sure that if for some reason, my laptop catches a virus because I'm sitting at Starbucks and I pick something up on the Wi-Fi that I didn't know I was picking up. When I try to send files home, the firewall can hopefully protect my internal network. Okay. There are four basic flavors of firewalls that I want to go over. The first one is host-based. You see, a firewall is basically software. It's services that look at the packets and say yes or no. You can come in or you can't. Now there's two basic flavors of permissioning, if you will. There's blacklisting and whitelisting. Whitelisting means you are only going to get through if you are on this approved list of places you can come from or file formats that I'm going to let through. Okay, so if you're not on this access list, if you're not on the invitation list, you don't get in. Very restrictive. Okay, it's a very restrictive, it's a little more secure. The blacklisting is, hey, last time you sent me a packet, it was bad. You're now on the, on the, on the, you're not allowed in list. So if you're blacklisted, like the term itself means, you're not allowed in. And you have to earn your way on the blacklist. I have to identify you as a threat and then you're on the blacklist, you can't get in, okay? Um, there's, there's, there's one particular brand, I can't remember what they're called, but basically they advertise that they have a really good whitelist, okay? They've chosen the whitelisting version of protection as opposed to the blacklisting. Um, it's one or the other, by the way. You, you can't really do both, 
okay? So you're, you're either whitelisting or you're blacklisting with your firewall. Now, host-based simply means it's software running on your computer. And all the modern OSs come with a host-based firewall. Windows has Windows firewall. Mac OS has a firewall. You can turn it on, you should turn it on, and it will attempt to keep out bad players. And by the way, Windows and Mac both update their lists, okay? So that if you if you keep your Windows or your Mac OS or your Linux or your Debian, whatever it is you're running that has a host-based firewall, if you keep that up to date, you're gonna be fairly well protected, okay? It's part of the security updates you get when Windows updates itself, okay? Windows, I believe, is called Windows Defender. All right, there's what's called a proxy firewall. This was an early type of device, um, and it was usually a gateway from one network to another that made sure only certain data got through. Okay, for example, if I'm only doing financial records for a bank, I'm only gonna let those files through. Nothing else is gonna get through, okay? And so proxies can have other functionality for making sure that you know the, the right business rules are in place and things like that. But uh, that was an early type of firewall. Now firewalls are a lot more robust and they become stateful, which is the next one we're gonna talk about. A stateful inspection firewall is what we consider the traditional firewall, okay? It allows or blocks traffic based on the state, the port, and the protocol. So it's whitelist, blacklist, um, are you coming through the right port? I can shut off, port 8080 is the internet port. I could just shut that off and not let any internet traffic through and only let local area network traffic through, okay? Um, I could have only that one on if it's a web server. I don't want any other, you can't come at me from any other port but 8080, or 8080, sorry. Um, and then um, it basically monitors all activity uh, of the connection until that connection is closed. So firewalls don't just like, oh, that first packet's okay, go ahead. They're watching everything that's coming in in case you created a valid connection and then you start sending malicious code. So it's gonna monitor it the whole time. And then you have what's called unified threat firewalls, which is a very comprehensive firewall, UTM firewalls. Um, they have the stateful inspection, but they also have antiviral inspection and they have intrusion prevention um, they can literally do what's called deep packet analysis to make sure that every packet that's coming in is thoroughly searched, okay? And there's patterns and things they can do. Um, I know from my military experience, we've got some really good ones, um, and they are very, very expensive. And to set the rules for what gets through can cost an awful lot of money because you got to recompile the whole firewall. Um, so UTM firewalls are very, very good and they're going to cost you. Okay. All right. Personal firewall. Are, those are smaller. You can buy a little firewall and set it up. It'll run with software that you set on your computer and it'll do all kinds of services for you. If you're, if you're, um, if you surf the internet a lot at home and you've got broadband, whether you've got you know, Comcast or AT&T or any other uh, high-speed internet access, you probably should think about maybe getting a low-cost firewall. Um, if you connect to the internet via public in Wi-Fi, if you work at Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, wherever, you really need your host-based firewall up and running as well. Um, and a lot of times these firewalls will alert you, hey, this looks bad, don't go here, or this, you know, here's a threat, what do you want me to do? And it can sandbox and isolate those files for you so you can go in and delete them and get rid of them, okay? Um, they're very, very configurable. So you can say, no, this is the site I meant to go. This is my, you know, high school uh, club for whatever, and they're on a server that I trust, even though it looks weird, okay, fine. So you can do that. You can configure those types of things. So switches build networks, routers connect different networks to each other, and firewalls keep bad players and bad packets out of our internal network. That's what we're gonna talk about for this video. In the next video, we're gonna to begin to discuss some of the network terminology you'll need to know as we lead up to how does the internet work. So I'll see you on the other side.